delinquencies are rising um, at a pace as fast as they had been rising into uh, the financial crisis year, so uh, on, on par with the 2006-2007 year um, that ultimately was, was a contributor not just with credit cards but defaults and delinquencies in general for credit. Um, of course, that was a big subprime problem, but into uh, the financial crisis. So, so there's stretching going on. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter and, of course, your host of this channel. And I'm looking forward to welcoming back somebody we've only interviewed a few weeks ago at the Rule Symposium in Boca Raton. But uh, I think quite a bit has happened that we need to catch up on. Some things we need to break down a bit more and uh, some things we just simply need to follow up on. And uh, maybe directions have shifted just a little bit. And some things I want to ask uh, ask about that we didn't have a chance to ask about in in. Uh, uh, in Boca Raton, in Florida, that is, for example, some of the commodities that uh, Nomi is following. And I just gave it away. Our guest is Dr. Nomi Prince. She's the founder of Prince Sites, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the next 30, 40 minutes with her because uh, we have lots to discuss, lots of content. So sharpen your pencils, get your paper ready. We'll, we'll get started now. Nomi, it is a great pleasure to have you back on the program. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Kai. Great to see you again. I was just uh, looking in the calendar. We scheduled this in May already. So you, you're a high in demand. So I really appreciate you making the time. Um, in the interim, we caught up in Boca Raton, Florida, which I absolutely enjoyed, which was a true pleasure. But uh, a few things have changed since we spoke. And uh, maybe we'll start there because uh, just an hour or so before hitting the record button, we got revised GDP number. And uh, it was revised upward to 3%. Um, it was sitting at 2.8%, I believe, before then. And uh, we, we have to break that down a little bit. Because both and I uh, were a bit confused by the uh, upward revision of the GDP number. Because we've been talking about economic slowdowns left, right, and center also on this channel. And we need to break that down. Maybe you can explain it for to, to us, Nomi. Like, where, where is that coming from? Yeah, it's interesting. And it just happened. We were just talking about it before, before this conversation. I expected GDP, which was originally at 2.8% up for the second quarter of 2024, to be revised down at the revision. So I'm usually right about that sort of thing. And it does um, surprise me, actually, that it instead was revised upward to 3%. Um, but similarly to what I, I thought analyzing the first 2.8% number was that if you dig into what what basically constitutes that now 3% increase a lot of it has to do with consumers and consumer debt why those two things because the consumer in the united states continues to buy things however the amount of products of services that are being purchased on debt continues to increase the debt payments that face the American consumer continue to increase. And that's just not credit cards, that's household debt, that's auto loans, that's credit card debt, basically across all debt categories as per uh, the latest New York Fed report on household debt. And what that means is that the consumer is stretching their budget through credit cards as opposed to through savings. And in fact, savings numbers have gone down this quarter, which is another indicator of that phenomenon. So it does mean that our, our growth really is, is constituted by debt. Our national growth, of course, is as well. We have over $35 trillion of debt as a nation, about 120% uh, debt to GDP figure. And if you basically adjust the 3% up GDP figure by inflation, it's, it's effectively flat still. So that's one of the reasons why if we look at what the numbers are saying at the surface versus digging into them and getting into the feeling and the actualities of what's facing um, the American population on the ground, they, they're very different. It's why the American citizen feels pinched, even though we're looking at GDP numbers, which, which for America actually look quite good. But again, you adjust for all these factors and, and they're really struggling. Uh, in interesting. Like maybe to follow up on that and maybe as a counterpoint is I'm looking at wage growth, right? So the consumer keeps spending, but the consumer is also making on average 5% more year over year. Is that like, how does that fit in? Well, the, the consumer uh, wages have, have increased. Yes. Inflation has increased with that. And, and wages in some areas um, are, are higher than inflation. If you look at it as an average, 
Um, if you look at it on, on a regional basis, on a rural basis, on a manufacturing belt basis, there are a lot of pockets of America where that's not the case. And so the average kind of um, smooths out what a lot of the population is, is really feeling. Um, and even in some of the urban areas where people um, are multi-juggling jobs and where they don't necessarily benefits for those jobs. And so they've got higher out-of-pocket medical expenses or childcare expenses and so forth. So if we look at wages in themselves, they're outpacing inflation, but we're also looking at, again, increased debt to bolster spending and increase payments to service that debt. Um, and and that, that does create a tension in, in the economy and for people. Like to, to follow up, like we're spending a bit of time on the consumer today because I think that the consumer is extremely vital to the U.S. economy. I think there's no way around it. it U.S. is a service-based economy. And to, you sort of touched on that, but maybe just to, to follow up on is essential versus discretionary spending. Like essentially, you mentioned housing, mortgage rates, but uh, how about spending on boats, for example, or uh, buying all beef hot dogs instead of the, the, the cheaper kind, right? Like what? trying to paint a picture here like can you sort of help us clarify that situation like where, what are people spending money on yeah um, it's interesting just just to touch on you mentioning hot dogs because i actually was doing an interview <laughs> yesterday with a with an old new york city based um interviewer um has his own show for you know decades and he always sort of calls it like it is and he said no me you know um apparently sausages uh are, are rising in price and that's an indication of a weakening economy because it is cheaper to buy pork-based products than beef-based products. So if we see an increase in demand for those products, you know, along the lines of hot dogs, that actually means that people are replacing certain items with other items because, um, you know, sort of ounce for ounce or pound for pound, they're cheaper, which drives up their prices and increases the inflation of those items. Um, so, so the economics are really interesting depending on, on how you look at it. But from the standpoint of the consumer in general, um, there are more food items being placed on credit cards, more utility bills and portions of utility bills are being placed on credit cards. Even rent where it's possible is more being placed on credit cards. So even though, again, from the outside, the, these payments are happening and it's adding to um, you know, the external economics and GDP of the country on a, on a digging into a basis on essentials versus non-essentials, people are putting more of their essentials and their non-essentials on credit cards. No, I appreciate you clarifying that. I think those are important points to understand um, and something to watch as well. Credit card delinquencies is another one you mentioned earlier, which is... And that is rising. Um, delinquencies are rising um, at a pace as fast as they had been rising into uh, the financial crisis year. So uh, on, on par with the 2006-2007 year um, that ultimately was, was a contributor, not just with credit cards, but defaults and delinquencies in general for credit. Um, of course, that was a big subprime problem, but into... Uh, the financial crisis. So, so there's stretching going on. Um, what's also been interesting is that credit card companies seeing this, um, and this has been a trend I've started to watch more closely, they're starting to give more offers to people with better credit ratings. Now, they always do that. They always want to kind of balance lending to people who have to pay more for their credit card debt because they're less, um, you know, sort of worthy credit card users in terms of their payments and their credit scores and so forth. But balancing that out with an increase in offers to people who can pay um, is really a way that we're seeing these, these credit card companies look at their full picture and say, we could have some problems on the one end, um, we really need to top that off with the higher credit worthy consumers on the other end. And so they are sending out offers really again at a rate of uh, 2006, 2007 to higher quality um, borrowers as well, as well as personal loans. Um, and to me, looking at banks for so many decades and looking at you know credit for so many decades, it's a sign that they're looking for that marginal benefit in case something goes wronger um, with delinquencies or defaults or overstretching of sort of the average consumer. 
Excellent points there, Nomi. I was like, I'll make an effort to pay more attention to like airline credit cards and uh, like those yeah. Chase credit cards that are really popular with travelers to see if they increase the welcome bonus and whether you get to 75,000 miles instead of 50,000 miles when you sign up for a credit card. So I'll, I'll pay attention to that. It's like I'm a bit of an AF geek and travel geek because I travel way too much and I enjoy it still way too much. So I, I'll, I'll pay attention you. to that. So <laughs> that, that speaks to me. That's something I can easily monitor and watch. Um, but trying to make a bit of a segue to the Fed, and I'm going to use the labor market as the segue here, Nomi. Um, weakening labor market. And Jerome Powell said last Friday, we do not seek or welcome further cooling in labor market conditions. And uh, I said it in other interviews, but when I was listening to it and I watched it, rewatched the press conference, he sounded quite nervous. Um, 4.3% percent doesn't sound like a dramatic number yes it's come up from three percent it is almost 50 percent higher than we were before if you look at it on a percentage basis but again nothing too dramatic but uh he, he must be seeing something else like w would you agree and what do you see nomi well first they did have a, an adjustment an annualized adjustment of 818,000 jobs that that weren't there that they they had said would be there um, and, 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 and that's one large adjustment and perhaps larger um, than Powell might have wanted to see. Um, but also the, the increase is, is worrying because on the surface we're saying that there's, um, you know, the labor market had been hot according to Powell, you know, six months ago. Um, he used the term hot labor market many, many times this year already. Um, and he kind of stopped in the last two press conferences, but not entirely. And it really isn't until the latest one um, and what had happened at, at um, Jackson Hole in terms of him saying now is the time for a rate cut effectively in September that he has been looking nervous. And th this is something that, that has been in the cards for a while. He has not, and the Fed has not really been paying attention to labor as much as they've been paying attention to controlling inflation. Of course, this is supposed to be their, their dual mandate. To, to control price stability or inflation and also um, the employment picture um, to get, quote, full employment. Uh, we've not been at full employment this entire time, but, but this is something that he'd been, he'd been focused on both verbally, um, but perhaps not looking at what he's now talking about as dual risks. He wasn't using the term risk on labor until within this last month. And so this is, I think, why he's looking more and more nervous, because when you start to verbalize the word risk and it's coming from his mouth and he thinks he might have missed something or the Fed might have missed something, um, that's where I think that nervousness starts to come in. Inflation, he sort of has a has a way of talking about um, the labor markets, quite something else. And 4.3 percent is not awful but it's 2017 levels. It's it's you know, if, if you forget the sort of covid really abnormal, as, as we all can agree, uh, bump up in unemployment because people weren't like officially at their jobs. Um, and, and it was a significant increase for it for a short period. But if we look at the trend, um, you know, sort of taking that out of, of unemployment, we're, we're back to um, levels, uh, you know, six, six, seven years ago. Um, and so that is worrying. And the fact that every every month we've been ticking up um, by a tenth of a percent, that that's a worry as well. Um, if we start to get to four and a half percent, I think he worries more. And if we start to get to five percent, I think he worries more. Um, I think between now and the end of the year, we could see that four and a half percent number. I don't think we get to five. Um, but I think that's their concern. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I had Michael, uh, Michael Oliver on the on the program here just yesterday or two days ago, and we we're talking about momentum, obviously, and um, trying to stop momentum in its tracks is by cutting rates. And uh, we have to talk about the implications of it. And uh, no, he's like looking at 4.3%, you mentioned it could be 4.5%. And it seems like the unemployment rate is accelerating. And uh, like, how much of an impact does even a rate cut have? How long does it take till it till you will see an impact in, in the in the uh, labor market? I don't think a rate cut of 25 basis points in September is going to fundamentally change the, the, the employment picture at all. Um, it, it's it's that signal and that potential to add to that, say, over the next uh, two FOMC meetings or, or, again, pay and indicate paying more attention to the labor market. Um, one of the things that's also happened with employment is that we have been in a period um, where, where people are actually hiring. And as we know now, um, they're not hiring to the same extent. And, and when hiring is happening, it's, 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 it's very sector specific. It's, it's government um, sector jobs as well. And we're also getting into the, the last quarter of the year. And, and, and generally, um, you know, particularly we're in an election year, you're moving towards the end of year. That's not really when companies bulk up on their payroll. It's, it's really when they potentially look to trim things, whether they're doing well or not. And so, again, that's one of the reasons 
reasons I, I see the unemployment potentially ticking up the rate no matter what happens um, with with interest rates. And I do think, and I wrote this in a piece um, out last week that the Fed, and I've been tweeting about it as well, that the Fed is a little bit behind the curve right now with respect to the labor market and, and, and what they're going to do with rates aren't necessarily going to, to change that dramatically um, you know, this year. Yeah, no, and excellent points there, Naomi. And then uh, curious, like what, what your thoughts are and like, where do you think the Fed's fund rate should be right now? Um, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, it's been five and a quarter to five and a half percent now for for a year, um, obviously up from zero for in um, March 2022. So it's, it's had quite a steep ascent, um, probably somewhere on the average in there, you know, three and a half to four percent or something basically commensurate with where inflation sort of is, um, would be would be appropriate um, with respect to the labor market um, and this period of time. I don't see that happening again this year, but I think we could get to a 4% um, if the economy um, does slow down more dramatically, um, if inflation does and the Fed can pivot. Um, but I think that's going to take a good 18 months. Yeah. No, there's always that lag effect and nobody knows how long it will take. Everybody's been calling for a recession. I think it's been three years now, two years. I don't know. I've been running this channel for four and a half years now almost. And it feels like we've been talking about a recession all constantly on it. And uh, we're still waiting. Right. Um, maybe just one backtrack or back uh, just a little bit coming back to inflation. I had, I've written down a question while you were chatting is like, how much of an impact did the Fed actually have on the inflation rate? 2.9%. What what role did the Fed play in it, if any? And I know it's a, a sort of it's a, almost a rhetorical question asking you know me so, but I think it's an interesting one. Um, I've, I've been of the opinion this entire cycle that um, if the Fed had done nothing, or if the Fed had done what it did, and we can't really create two parallel universes, inflation would pretty much be where it is now anyway. And the reason I say that is because um, well, there's two forms of inflation. There, there's the one that the Fed has absolutely no control over, and that has to do with uh, supply chains, commodity cycles, geopolitical events, transportation disruptions, um, the climate situations that happen in in uh, in agricultural locations and so forth. So, I mean, there, there's so many things that impact um, inflation once once there's a kind of catalyst of any kind. Um, and in this scenario, we had we had a couple of main catalysts happen within a short period of each other. We had COVID, um, which was obviously massive disruption everywhere, disruption to energy, to commodities, to transportation of them, to, to services, to mining, stopping and then starting. Um, and, and we still have a little bit of residue from that. And that was compounded um, by uh, the escalation of the Russia-Ukraine war and other geopolitical tensions like what's happening in the Middle East, et cetera, around the world. So you, you have a bunch of external factors that were related to these these um, catalysts that, that have been playing out. Um, and now we're at a situation where some of that has normalized, where mines have, you know, for example, come back online, where transportation routes have shifted to an extent, where um, there have been solutions that have uh, sort of gone over um, what has happened with geopolitical tensions, although, of course, that always remains a risk um, to inflation and to disruption of supply chains. Um, there have been a reconsideration of supply chains by the United States with a lot of new legislation related to um, domestic supply, as other countries have done around the world and securing supply around the world. And all of that um, has been a part of tempering what we see as inflation. Now, what the Fed can control or central banks can control is monetary inflation. They can control um, to an extent how much money is flowing in an economy. If you look at inflation in just those terms, um, it, it, you know they, they can have an impact. But if we look at inflation in real terms, in real asset terms, um, I, have, I don't think the Fed really had much to do with any of where we're at right now. Um, and I don't think also, for example, if you look at the stock market um, as just a separate um, indicator of the um, ineffectiveness of tightening policy on, on financial asset prices, um, for the most part, you know, you step back from the chart of the SP 500, the NASDAQ, the Dow, you, you see a pretty much trend line up. Lots of volatility, lots of angst over what the Fed's going to do and when and, and events that happen and, and how they play out. But for the most part, uh, the Fed's been raising rates, then stopping. Now it'll go to cutting. But before that happens, the market's been um, chumming along. So even monetary uh, policy uh, related inflation hasn't been subdued with respect to speculation 
of, of financial assets and markets. So uh, this is a long-winded way of saying, and I, I've been saying this for years, is that what, what the Fed or central banks do with rates, um, despite how much we talk about them and pay attention to them, uh, don't necessarily have an impact for good or for bad on real asset prices, and therefore on many aspects of inflation. That last point is, is, is important because that's where I was going to go because I keep looking at real estate, especially here in Germany or even in the US, and prices aren't coming down. So the Fed didn't have any impact. Like the disinflation or even deflation I was hoping for in housing prices because uh, I'm a little bit in the market here. You know, I'm looking here and there, but uh, it's not coming down. So like it didn't have an impact. Like maybe it might have slowed down. It might have put out some handyman out of business because people are waiting. It's not because they don't want to spend. They're just waiting because they know it's going to get cheaper again. Or they think it is, and then they're going to pop back in and spend, and it's going to, you know, sort of raise the demand for the, for, for the supply of whatever the, that that labor and the, those products are at the time. Um, you know, in California, things continue to be built, and, and um, you can't actually get a handyman to come because um, they're all actually quite busy. So it, it is something that's continued. There's been a teeny bit of dampening in housing prices, you know, given a, a particular month or two here and there. But again, the trend has been up despite – what the Fed has done. The only thing that has actually increased um, are the payments that people are making because rates on mortgages are higher per month on people that bought within this higher rate period. Um, the people that bought before this rate period have 2% mortgages um, in the United States or 3% mortgages in the United States um, pre-raising rates. They, they mostly didn't sell their places, right? Because they're sitting there saying, "We when are we when are we going to get back to 2 or 3%? Why, why would we literally swap that out for a higher um paying mortgage rate well you know higher cost mortgage rate. we'll just we'll just wait that out um so to an extent that supply hasn't come back into the market and to an extent that's kept prices up but so so has just general demand and um this is global like you're saying you're, you're seeing it there i was reading an article about how like everyone is right now moving to portugal because quote it's cheap but the prices there have escalated by like you know tens of percentages points in the in multiples in the last like year um so uh, the money that is there is finding its way and, and those assets like real estate assets um are continuing to to rise the fed hasn't changed that they have not changed rents uh they haven't changed the cost of utilities the cost of food i mean literally this is an entity that talks about its its um ability and we believe in its ability to to fight price stability and instability and inflation and non-inflation, but, but actually has no jurisdiction over most of what happens. No. It's, it's interesting. I keep wondering, like, and it almost sounds naive, but uh, what direct impact to my wallet did the Fed have? Like, yes, I'm in Germany, I get that, but I see myself as a general consumer. What direct impact did it have? Did it have, right? The, the rising rates. Prices didn't come down for, for things I need and look for, right? Uh, cars didn't really get cheaper. Like, I've just been reading a little bit that um, used cars are coming down just a little bit. But as you said, like, not not in a, in a what do you call it, in a magnitude that is relevant. They would say, okay, let's, let, let's buy every single car off the lot because uh, they're dirt cheap right now. That's not the case. So, That's right. Um, no, really interesting statements there. And uh, by the way, Portugal is also of interest because there's no capital gains tax. So. That's going to be of interest more in the United States um, if, if there is a Harris administration, because, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, there's, there's lots of things going on in both the economic plans and things that aren't going on. But but one of the possibilities is a significant raising of capital gains tax. And uh, that could that could be positive for Portuguese real estate. That's all I'm saying. Un unrealized gains tax that that just. Uh... Unrealized gains. That makes, that makes my makes my hair stand back, uh, back up because right. I'm a pragmatic, and that does not make any sense to me at all. Like, I don't even know how you track all. that, honestly. I mean, I mean, it's a year end number, but but it, it's it's going to, um, well, it's going to be very interesting. But but again, the upside could be, or the hedge could be, uh, Portuguese real estate. So. Yeah. Now let's not go down, uh, further down that rabbit hole because um, I have to ask you personally. Like, what, what do you think the, the Fed is going to do in about twenty days? Are you in the camp twenty five basis points or fifty basis points? And uh, if you were in the latter, what signal would that send? Yeah. So I'm in the, the twenty five basis point camp, and that's because I just I. It's hard for me to accept that that um, Chairman Powell would be able to speak and, and create a, a, a reason for it being such a significant change all of a sudden, as opposed to having more of 
the ability to say words that will indicate it'll be parceled out if they do continue to cut rates over um, the rest of the year in some manner. Um, and I think it would look more like the Fed's trying to both catch up and admit they're trying to catch up to, in, in this case, it would be the labor market because inflation is you know, just uh, CPI at 2.9%. So it's it's not really uh, 2%, which is what you know Powell's been talking about for, for so long. Uh, and that's why I see it at 25 instead of 50. Yeah. No, it makes sense. And uh, I, I, I keep coming back to Michael Oliver because I interviewed him yesterday and uh, he predicts 50 basis point cut, um, although the market expects 34 and a half percent chance of that. But uh, mm. he, he says, like, once the Fed starts cutting, um, the market will top out. And uh, it seems like we're seeing that pattern forming. I'm not a chart analyst, so I'll leave that to the experts. But I'm curious now maybe shifting to the markets here. Do you see the market topping out? And uh, in in three weeks, do you think uh, the markets will sort of start uh, slow decline here? I think a lot of that will depend on on Powell words for a minute. But but if we look at the, the, the trends, there, there's no real reason to assume that if money's a modicum cheaper than it, than it has been, which would be the case in a 25 basis point cut, um, or even a 50 basis point cut, that that's going to fundamentally impact um, where investors are, are seeking their money, I think, are, are seeking to spend their money. I, th I think if that were the case, the fact that the dollar has been declining um, significantly for it, for the dollar, given that the Fed hasn't yet cut rates over the last several months, and particularly since June, um, that would be more of an indication, I think, that the markets would be declining with it, but they haven't been. And so therefore, I think they've shown resiliency um, and a sort of, we don't really care what the Fed does, except on any given day, we're happy to jump down by a thousand points and then jump up by a thousand points over the next two days following that. Um, and so I do think we could see a slowing trend. I could see uncertainty around the election. I could see uncertainty around tax policy, again, particularly if um, we do get a Harris administration and we actually get um, these sorts of capital gains and other type of financial asset taxes. Um, but again, that remains to be seen as well. And I think the market can shrug that off until they actually see evidence um, also over trend. So I don't I don't really see that, um, you know, more than sort of periodic interim buying opportunity type of, of, of downfall um, that some others are seeing in the markets. Oh, interesting comment there. And I'm curious how, they, how it all plays out. Um, no, I mean, in, in preparation of this interview, I've noticed that we haven't talked about the U.S. debt situation in a, in a while on this channel. And I'm wondering why that is. Like, we're, we're, we're above 30, $35 trillion. I remember we talked about it, um, you know, tangentially. I hope that's the right word. Um, in Boca Raton in Florida. But uh, how concerned are you about the U.S. debt situation? It doesn't seem like it's a big factor anymore, especially given the U.S. elections. Nobody's talking about it. Yeah, zero people are talking about it. I, I just came back from the, the DNC in Chicago. I speak regularly with, with people on the Republican side. There is no presidential platform um, from the Trump or the Harris campaigns that have a plan or discussion um, of debt. And in fact, both of their plans um, for their similarities, which there are some and their differences, which there are also some, um, would rely on increasing debt. Um, and so now that we have this, this incredibly high debt, um, we also have a situation where before the U.S. opens its doors as a nation, turns on the lights um, at the White House, has almost a trillion dollars worth of debt payments to make in terms of interest on, on servicing the debt that's already extending. And, and that, that number um, is only going to increase. Um, if anything is going to be impacted, actually, by Fed rate cuts, it's going to be the cost of servicing U.S. debt. That would be um, the, the main uh, actual mathematically um, measurable uh, impact. But both parties are not focusing on, on how economic growth or a strategy for economic growth could at least grow the economy around the debt or shrink the debt, either one of those two things. It's it's a really important topic because uh, and you told me before hitting the record button you're in you're sort of personally invested and not fin financially to a degree probably as well into setting up a development bank sort of like the German development the KFW bank I think there's a couple other development banks around the world um, how does that impact you when you're sort of uh, so solicit for money I think that's pretty much w what it is like and I hope I didn't you know, use the wrong term here, but in the end, you need funding for it. That's that's what I, the word I was looking for. You need funding for that development bank. Is there even funding available for a project like that? 
Well, the, the, the legislation that I, that I am in, involved with actually doesn't require funding from the government or debt or taxes. And why? Because this development bank or an infrastructure bank, so just, just looking at modernizing, upgrading, and, and, and a future strategy for U.S. infrastructure that, that is well classified um, in categories by the American Society of Civil Engineers, which is a very um, well thought of body that classifies needs and, and, and costs for, for various infrastructure upgrades across the country. Um, this a national infrastructure bank um, of the kind that, that, that I'm involved in, in, in working toward would operate like a commercial bank in that it would be seeded with existing treasury bonds. Um, so it wouldn't go out into the market and raise new debt or new bonds. It would basically say, hey, look, pension fund, government, etc. cetera. Um, if you pledge or, 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 or uh, swap your treasury bonds that you already have into the bank, um, you'll get a return um, that's slightly higher than that based on um, loan income that would come in from the bank making loans like a standard commercial bank. So it'd be a 10 to one uh, loan to, to reserve value. The reserves would be treasuries that already exist. So in effect, it would be um, reducing the debt or at least repurposing the debt for infrastructure and growth rather than just being out there and no one knows what it's doing and <laughs> just sort of increasing. Um, and the, the regulation of the bank and, and the loan integrity analysis of the bank would be, um, would be very well um, sort of monitored um, with you know, the sorts of loan specialists and um, sector specialists that would ensure that um, the loans are paid back. Um, and it would also have a reserve fund to make sure if loans aren't paid back, there is um, or, or can't be paid back for good projects. Those projects would actually have um, grants associated with them that will come from loan income as well. So it, it would basically be safer um, than a JP Morgan Chase or, or a Citigroup um, that um, do lend for infrastructure, but but not very much and certainly not enough to um, increase growth or economic development or, or infrastructure. And, and as you mentioned, KFW is just one of several that Germany has, uh, China has development banks, Brazil basically built its entire power infrastructure on the big, on the basis of its development bank. Um, and these are shown not to really increase debt, but to just increase um, economic efficiencies in their areas. And, and that would be the idea. What do you think the investment capital needed is for the, for the U.S.? And I'm thinking it, uh, you know, just taking power lines underground uh, for for example, is is a really interesting project because I, I drive around and I see it and it reminds me of Southeast Asia, some certain mm -hmm. areas because the power lines are all above ground. A windstorm comes, blows them over, mm -hmm. no electricity for for days. So like, just curious, like, what is the the investment capital or the the investment demand needed to to sort of realize those infrastructure projects? So, so the the initial funding um, for this bank in, in the bill, um, and when I say funding, again, I mean leverage of the reserves would require half a billion dollars worth of treasuries, um, and on of existing treasuries, and on a ten to one leverage basis, that provides five trillion dollars worth of asset capital or, or loan capital to invest in infrastructure. The power lines themselves, there's different um, figures. Um, I believe the American Society uh, Civil Engineers talks about a 300 to $550 billion number for, uh, for, for power lines throughout the country um, and upgrading, modernizing, whatever that means in different locations. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure law provided, I think, $79 billion um, over five years to, to fund that. And, and that law um, has about two and a half more years to go. And then you get back to haggling about the budget with Congress. So again, a, a financing mechanism would, would hopefully alleviate that pain. Um, but they, they, they're, they're, not, they're not cheap. I mean, you're right. They're, they're, the weather, age, um, modernization, I mean, so much needs to have, has, has basically impacted where our power lines are and what they should be, safety matters and so forth, um, that it's expensive. And you keep pushing any project um, down the line and you do run into more supply chain issues or cost issues or labor cost issues and, and whatever, whatever it might be. Things don't get cheaper. Um, anyone who wants to renovate their house today, for example, and you know, taking out power lines and massive, you know, national infrastructure knows that whatever you do today is going to be cheaper than whatever you do two years from now and five years from now, and 10 from, years from now, even though it's not going to be cheap. Commodity prices is the perfect segue to, or it's a perfect segue to get to commodity prices. But before we do commodity prices, I'm curious, do you know what the largest infrastructure projects in the U.S. are right now? Because I've noticed a lot of money is flowing into airports in the U.S. right now. Those are the ones I notice. Like, what are some of the other projects? Do you, do you know? It's just to humor me. Uh, 
Um, I mean, the, 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 there's 16 categories um, that the that, that the Society of Engineers has. I mean, it, it is ports, it is airports, it is broadband, it is power lines, um, roads, highways. Um, you know, th th there are there are different allocations to all those things, um, and um, there's there's cyber securing what they are. So there's there's tangential allocations that come into building. Um, those bridges are huge. Uh, necessity in the United States to be upgraded for, for safety and structure and national security and economic transport reasons. Um, so it, it, th there's a lot of different buckets. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. No, I'm curious, like since we were talking on that, because I see the, the U.S. Uh, investing a lot into their airports lately, and I'm sure there's other sectors and, as you said, buckets as well. So uh, yeah. really interesting. Um, just sort of the last topic no, we need to touch on is, of course, commodities. And uh, we've seen a lot of rising com uh, commodity prices, copper and talking about power and uh, power infrastructure, copper price topped over $5. Um, let's talk commodities in general. Like how, how do you see the prices develop given the economic slowdown that seems to be looming? I'm curious what your outlook is here. Yeah, I, I think we're in the midst of an ongoing commodity escalation right now in prices because even with some of the economic growth figures um, slowing down uh, the reality is commodities are needed for very long-term projects um, so for example if we look at um, you know you mentioned copper um, which is which is needed for long-term projects whether that's grids or power lines or, or, or piping um, you know, water related activities conductivity necessities um, you know they're there and, and just getting it out of the ground and process so that it's available that there, there is um, a, a need to basically supply more copper into the future um, and that needs to be done now and that's why we're seeing prices go up and demands going up and and, and placement um, future placement of, of contracts in order to to, to get copper um, in later years is also elevating some of those prices um, if we look at something like uranium um, and nuclear energy what we're seeing there is um, there's a significant amount of building going on right now for new uh, nuclear plants China is leading that charge Russia is is very high on that uh, the United States is somewhat lower um, but as nuclear energy for example becomes um, you know realized as as something that you know is cop um, the COP23 meeting um, said we would have a tripling of that. The United States, the UK, 22 countries um, agreed to that. Um, that needs structure. And what we're seeing right now is a significant amount of capacity that's going to be coming online, current plants being built, new plants being planned that have already been approved and ones that are planned that even haven't been approved. All of these things are going to need fuel to operate them, and that's going to require uranium, a lot of which is um, still in the ground or needs to be processed and needs to be refined and needs to be made um, a more efficient fuel as technologies to do that continue to advance during that process. So, so the commodity cycle actually has to build into a long-term infrastructure and energy cycle, which is in progress right now, regardless of what happens um, in sort of shorter term economic cycles along the way. Um, Silver is also a part of that. Something like gold, which also has um, infra some infrastructure uses, obviously has also um, been rising as well as, as, as a hedge to everything that, um, that happens on the central bank side. And we've certainly seen that rise um, as well as the diversification assets, as well as an asset that has um, use value. So I think for commodities in general, general um again any given moment like with the market you can you can see you can see down days you know you can see up days but as a trend i, I think we are at the beginning of, of of a need trend that is driving uh the demand for a lot of commodities that are transforming our world and and for which projects have already been green lighted or in process and will continue to be in process unless something mega happens like you know a covid type of shutdown or something like that which which we don't know or like a meteor hits somewhere or something mm -hmm. like that um but that, that they're in play and they're going to need uh commodity supply yeah, hundred percent. And uh, just electrification is a big, bit, a big, big topic. Copper, um, uranium is a really interesting one. And I saw you recently just put out a piece uh, on uranium, and uh, the, the case for uranium is a really interesting one. And uh, I want to touch on the geopolitical situation because the U.S. banned the import of uranium, enriched uranium as well, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm curious, like, and that's that's a question I have for myself and maybe the audience too. Is like. Where are we going to get enriched uranium from to fuel our reactor or the reactors in the Western world? It's a great question. The, the banning of, of um, Russian imports of uranium bill was passed in May. It was it was uh, 
the fourth of several large nuclear-related bills that have been passed recently in the United States, even into an election year, which, as I pointed out in that piece, is is pretty rare um, for agreement on anything, especially into an election year. And it really did come down to nuclear um, and, and a... And a upgraded strategy there. Um, there is until 2028 in the bill where um, certain uh, utilities can continue um, to access uranium outside of the United States, but it has to sort of be approved. Um, but that's going to be phased out. And um, also that bill just took effect this month, even though it, it, um, it was passed in May. So a lot going on there. And what's been happening in the United States is um, domestic mines that have been closed for years um, are being reopened. Um, UEC just opened a mine out in Wyoming. Um, Energy Fuels is is uh, planning to open its mine just not for rare, not just for rare earths, but also for uranium in um, in Utah. Um, and so there's there's just more of a rush to um, to to open to reopen mines and to explore uh, for more uranium to really fill that domestic supply requirement. Has that trickled down into the price yet? Um, are, you, are you seeing that, like the restrictions coming in, like the domestic supply, uranium, has that any uh, has that had any effects yet? Or we're still in the sort of 80s range um, in, in terms of uranium. It, it kind of re it reached uh, over 100 earlier this year and it declined a bit since then. And it's kind of finding a range now. So it hasn't bumped it back to, to 100, but, but it's certainly created more attention for the miners themselves. Um, and I think... Um, unlike gold, where we've seen mining companies sort of lag gold prices, I think with uranium, there, there's sort of a, a bit of a reversal going on right now. But but I think uranium prices are consolidating here, um, and from here they would be going up. Besides uranium, what other metal are you bullish on? Um, well, we talked about copper. I'm, 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 I'm bullish on anything in electrification or, or in infrastructure building. I'm bullish on aluminum, um, you know, in terms of uh, and, and steel, in terms of building bridges. And, you know, you mentioned airports building, building heavy infrastructure um, and rare earth uh, elements, which come into building, you know, the, the, the chips and um, will we'll have a big play in the, the, the semiconductor fabs that are being created um, in the United States and actually all around the world to um to create more chips, to create more um, of a space to hold you know, data and processing technologies and everything else that's going to require um, rare earth materials. And also they get used in permanent magnets, um, which are part of um, the defense department and the space department's um, demands. And so I think that's a longer term growth cycle for those commodities because they're less known to investors. Um, but from the standpoint of product uses, I think that's going to also be a space to watch over the next next couple of years. Yeah, no, phenomenal. Like I'm fully aligned here with you as well. I just hope the miners, the, the shares themselves, start moving finally. And yeah. talking primarily precious metals miners, because uh, my portfolio could use a little bit of a a, a, a jump start here. Uh, I have to admit. Um, Nomi, like time has flown by, 42 minutes. I can't believe it. But I do have one last summary question for you. It sort of put a bow around everything. If the average in investor were to come to you with $100,000 to say, Nomi, help me invest. And again, this is not financial advice, but uh, where, how would you allocate $100,000 right now? Uh, it's it, it's a good question. Obviously, all of that has to do with what their what their what their risk tolerance is when they need the money, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> as we know, and and we do talk about this a lot on on uh, on my Substack on print sites because um, how I look at our analysis and and even our uh, considerations for recommendations is in a portfolio way um, and in a diversification way. Um, and I would say that you do want about. Um, you know, 30 to 40 percent of your portfolio in, in, in real assets. Um, so that's gold, that's silver, that's copper, that's uranium. Um, you also want it in, in the companies that are basically producing and using those assets to transform things. So in your utility companies, in your um, engineering companies, in your defense companies, um, you do want to keep some cash aside because you don't want to spill it all in one place. And you also want to keep some money on the, in the technology and AI space, not necessarily following NVIDIA up, and that, that's not a recommendation one way or another, um, but looking outside of that space to where government contracts are coming in, um, which is something we spent a lot of time looking at, you know, where, where are governments putting their money, um, where private investment is going to be following because that money is secure in a certain area. Um, and so in general, that, that to me is a, a category in and of itself. No, phenomenal. 
no me i really appreciate as i said earlier it's like i can't believe 40 what is it now 43 minutes have just flown by it's probably the the quickest 43 minutes uh, i've had here on the channel in a long time really Thank appreciate you. your insights where where can we follow your work Nomi? um so the best place is my Substack right now that's where my notes are that's where my thoughts are my videos my my recommendations um and that's printsites.substack.com Fantastic. You also run a YouTube channel where I saw you, you put out some commentary as well. And uh, we'll definitely link to everything down below. So Dr. Nomi Prince, you. really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Can't wait to do this again very soon. And maybe right after the elections, get your take on uh, what are some of the uh, the infrastructure projects going to look like? Because I saw an article in Reuters this morning that especially some of the mining companies are running towards the uh, Department of Energy to, to, to lock in funding before right. a regime, potential re regime change in the US. So that's another big topic we can tackle next time. But uh, until then, Nomi, thank you so much. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation here on SOAR Financially. I hope it was informative. If it wasn't, let us know down below. Like we're doing this for you. We're trying to educate. We're trying to make sense of all the noise out there. That's why we discuss the macro to understand the micro. We really appreciate you tuning in. Leave a comment, leave a like, subscribe to the channel, hit that bell icon. It it helps us out tremendously, increase our reach and bring phenomenal guests like Nomi on the channel. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here on Sword Financial.